Thank you.
So Shabbat Shalom, everyone. For those of you who are joining us live, wherever you are, Shabbat Shalom to you. Happy Sabbath. We're glad that you're joining us. And so we're at another Sabbath. And it seems like we just, we, we keep going uh, <clears throat> one week after another, but yet there's always new developments uh, prophetically. So uh, we're going to be getting to a lot of prophecy, but particularly the importance on the subject of the mark of the beast. And so... Uh, it's this one I, I thought was a very interesting study. I, I, I studied into this and I thought that there was some profound insights that I hope that you'll also appreciate as well with me, um, as well as those of you who are watching. And I pray that uh, as we're watching, of course, we're praying for, for myself so that I can speak what our Heavenly Father wants me to speak. Uh, and also that you are prepared to receive whatever counsel he wants to give to you personally. We have to be in continual fellowship, abiding in the faith of the Son, abiding in Yeshua. Uh, if we're not abiding in him and we're not walking in him and we're not having that, that living connection with him, we're going to find that our faith is failing us. Uh, or that things separate us, things occupy our thoughts, our attention, our mind, and then we start speaking about things that really uh, don't deserve and are not worthy of our time, uh, uh, our efforts, and and so forth. So, so it's so important to, to keep to keep connected. Now, before I begin, I I want to pray, uh, just as we just said, and then ask that my fumbling lips. Uh, might be um, touched with a call from the altar because I need it. Because without, without our Heavenly Father and without the Spirit, I know that I can really uh, not hope for much. And you can't hope for much either uh, without the blessing of our Heavenly Father. So I'm going to pray and I invite you all to, to join with me uh, as I'm, I'm going to bow. So if you want to join me. Ah. Merciful, loving Father in heaven, I want to praise you and thank you for your word. That you are good and you speak your word of truth to us, the word of faith, the word of life. And Father, I thank you for the light of life that is in your holy Son, your only begotten. That through him, our high priest, we might find life. Thank you, Father, for his intercession. I thank you, Father for your mercies. They're new every morning. And I thank you, Father, for the morning sacrifice. I thank you for that Yeshua, your lamb, your who you've appointed to be our salvation, and he's the salvation that is in your hands. You have given him to us. Father, I thank you for this. And now, Heavenly Father, I pray that you will please take my lips, take my heart, take my mind, lay your hand upon me that I may speak only the words you would have me to speak, that I will refrain from speaking the things you don't want me to say. Father, who, can, who, who is able to give the light as you give it to a man? How can we impart that which you have given to us, except you are with us? So, Father, I, I'm asking that you will please 
be with me and speak through me. Convict the hearts of those who are listening. Taylor, make the message for them, those who are listening now, those who are listening later. And Father, may you also speak to me as the message is being given. Thank you for the living coal of Yeshua, the living coal from the altar to purify the lips that we may be a holy vessel to you. So please, may your will be done in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, so, <clears throat> so to begin with, I'm going to give you a parable. And this parable is not something you find in the Bible. It's not something you'll find in Apocrypha. It's, uh, it's something I prayerfully have just written. As an illustration of the importance of leaving the cities. Because right now, we're beginning to face a tremendous crisis throughout the world. And what will the end be if many who have had the message, who have had the light, who have had the call to get out from Babylon, to get out from not only the fallen churches, but also the cities that are ripe for judgment. If they don't heed the call, what shall be their end? And so. This morning, this was what was especially laid upon my heart. So I'm going to give you a parable concerning it. And it will be something that you can reflect on. To what shall we compare delaying the leaving of the cities to? It is like two women who received a good inheritance from their father and who waited in a den of thieves. And when it was heard that the first woman had a rich inheritance from her father, the robbers arose from their den and went out to her car, and they seized it. And they did whatsoever they wished to it, and the woman ran out too late. And when it was heard that the second woman had a rich inheritance from her father, the second woman arose and hasted to her vehicle before the robbers and removed herself far from that place. Now tell me, What's going to be the end of the first woman who didn't flee out of the den of thieves before it was too late? Truly, she was unable to leave. She couldn't flee. It was too late. And she was ravaged and robbed of her inheritance and her life because she foolishly delayed to depart from the den of thieves. And what about the second? She shall keep her inheritance and her life, because she wisely fled from the face of the robbers with haste. May our Heavenly Father give you consideration where you are standing at this present time, if you are in the cities. Consider diligently the time in which we are living. And may the blessing come as you are faithful to what He has called you to do. When we look at the book of Revelation, we look, Roxandra, could you actually get me my, uh, my, my paper Bible? I don't want the, the digital Bible. It's in the room. It was on my bedside where I was reading it. Thank you. The book of Revelation is called the Revelation of Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The Revelation, right? That's what the book is. And it is, of course, the whole book is to be a revelation of Him. Now, when we look at Him and who he is, and what should the book of Revelation reveal to us? More than dragons and beasts, because we are going to be looking at the beasts. We are going to be uh, understanding the nature of some of the, uh, the wickedness that is warned about in the warning messages in the book of Revelation. But we want to set the proper context for what the revelation of Yeshua really is. How are we going to behold him? What does it mean to behold him? What does that look like? When we look at his ministry upon the earth, when we look in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there is distinctive light pertaining to what it says about him and his message. Particularly, I'm going to list seven points. Thank you so much. 
particularly I'm going to lift, list, listen to seven, uh, list seven points. Now, if my mic sounds bad, it's because we're having a mic crisis since last week, and that still hasn't really been able to be resolved. Hopefully, it will come through by the grace of God. Now, he called, when we look at what he did, what is revealed and displayed in his message. The very first message that he gave was to repent for the kingdom of Yah is at hand. So immediately what is revealed is the message of repentance because of the imminency of the kingdom of God. Then when we look at it, he called the preaching of the gospel the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is the preaching of the gospel. Then when we look on the Sermon on the Mount, he preached the way of the kingdom of heaven. How to operate and how to live and abide as walking according to that kingdom. But more than that, he lived the revelation of that kingdom while on earth. So when you look at how he was living, what he was proclaiming, and what, what he's preaching of the gospel, it is everything to do with the kingdom. When he spoke of the mysteries of the kingdom of Yah, he spoke them through parables. The parables were for the purpose of revealing, or in, in only to those to whom it was given, the mysteries of the kingdom of Yah. When we look at those parables, we're told that the good seed was the word of the kingdom. When we look at the wheat that is begotten by that good seed, the word of the kingdom, they are called the children of the kingdom. The wheat that is begotten by the good word of the kingdom. Now, when he cast out devils, he says in one gospel that he cast them out by the spirit of Yah. The other one says that he cast them out by the finger of Yah. The finger. What did you do with the finger? What did, what did God do with his finger? He wrote the commandments, right? The commandments of his kingdom. So it says that this was a fundamental thing of his message, that whenever he cast out devils by the finger of God, when he did this, he said that the kingdom of God has come to such a one. Whenever he cast out devils, the kingdom of God had come near to them. The devil cannot be where the kingdom is because the devil was cast out of that kingdom. Now, further than this, in the last point, he said, and this is probably the, the most important because it really goes all together, that the kingdom of Yah, if you have the Spirit of God, is in you. So then we can deduce, just based on how much the kingdom was central and really a cornerstone of his message, that the gospel of the kingdom, the, the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah, the revelation of Jesus Christ, is the revelation of the kingdom of God. The revelation of the kingdom of God and the revelation of Jesus Christ, they are one and the same. So then when we look at the book of Revelation, we should see what it means to have a revelation of the kingdom of God. And I'm not just talking about the last few chapters of the book of Revelation, where we see the new Jerusalem descending, and we see that we're going to be at the throne of God. I'm not talking about that, but I'm, I'm speaking more specifically what it means to be abiding, walking in that kingdom, walking in that message, walking in the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel of the kingdom means to have the power of the kingdom. So if we understand that those two, the revelation of Yeshua and the revelation of the kingdom are synonymous, when we look at the beast in Bible prophecy, particularly the book of Revelation, it sets the pr appropriate context. The, the basis for which the kingdom of Yah is being challenged because when you see beasts in Bible prophecy, according to Daniel chapter 7, verse 23, it says that the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom upon the earth. 
Therefore, these kingdoms in the book of Revelation are kingdoms of men that are making war with the kingdom of God. They are kingdoms specifically. It doesn't mean that you don't have a lot of kingdoms in the world. You have a lot of them. But these are the chief agents whereby uh, Satan, the enemy of souls, is particularly interested in pushing and furthering his purposes in all the nations of the earth. So that's why you don't see a great number of beasts in the book of Revelation. You see very specific ones, very specific characters that are in, in this book. Now, it's interesting that they're, they're called, it's not called the kingdoms of men when you look at these beasts. They're beasts. An animal, a lion or a dragon or whatever beast it is, a beast is lower than a man. These kingdoms, it's not the kingdom that was given to Adam, which was still part of the kingdom of God, but when the kingdom was rent from Adam through transgression, and he had yielded himself and fallen under the voice of his wife, and the wife had fallen under the voice of the serpent, they had fallen under the dominion of the beast. So the dominion of the beast has been since, since the beginning. And so we see that controversy going all the way from the book of Genesis all the way to the very end, to the book of Revelation, to the very last test, for the first test of man to the very last test of man. And the last test of man is the mark of the beast crisis. And that's going to be challenging the kingdom of God for those who are proclaiming and living and abiding in the gospel of the kingdom. Now, I'm going to read about some of those beasts. And I'm going to highlight and bring out certain points. Revelation chapter 13. And I'm going to start with the second beast. We know, I think already, I hope we have a foundation that the first beast, and this is no surprise, the first beast, I've, I've commented on this week after week, that it is the papal church and state system. You can prove that in 20 different ways. It's, it's very comprehensive. But when we look at that other beast that arises up out of the earth, I want to look at specific and particular details about this beast that relates to that papal church and state beast. Revelation 13, verses 11 and 12, and then I will jump over to 15 and read through to 17. So then I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. So we know that the first beast, the papacy, has lost its power. And it says that there is going to be the second beast, which is going to exercise all the power of the first beast once the deadly wound is healed. Now, what is the power of the first beast? I just want to look at the, that for a moment. Revelation chapter 13, it says so many times, power, power, power. And so I want to look at exactly what that is. So if we look at the first beast and what power was exercised by him, who first off, who gave him the power? Remember, it was a three-in-one beast, a trinity beast, triune beast, a bear, a leopard, and a lion sitting on the throne of a dragon. The dragon was symbolized by Rome. The Roman Empire, of course, is the very kingdom that, that reveals the enmity of Satan because it was in that kingdom's period that Yeshua, our Messiah, was crucified. And you, so you see the heart of Satan especially revealed in the Roman Empire. Starting at verse 2, uh, just highlighting those word, the word power, because it's found uh, five times in Revelation 13. It says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. So you know this ecumenical beast with ecumenical body parts of different pagan kingdoms. And the dragon gave him his power, that word again, power, and his seat, and great authority, or his throne and great authority. And so he did take uh, the, the seat of the Roman Empire. Now, 
what was the power that was given to him? Well, we're told how long he's given power in verse 5. It says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. So we know the duration of that power that he was exercising. That was for 42 months or 1260 years that he was exercising the, that, that papal darkness, that papal oppression in Europe before it received the deadly wound, which ends up being revived. Now verse 7 says what kind of power it was u utilizing. It says and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and power was given to him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. So you understand it's a, it's a power that ends up having authority over peoples and to make war with the saints, make war with the holy ones. Who are the saints? Well, Revelation 14 says that they're the ones. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, the Torah of God. That's, that's what it is. And the faith of Yeshua. You need to have those together. You can't have them apart or else you don't have any of it. So that second beast is going to exercise all that power of oppressiveness that was oppressed, that was exercised in the Dark Ages. And we're going to see that first beast also reviving on the world stage to worship the first beast. Starting again, jumping to verse 15. And he had power to give life or breath. That word for, is actually breath or spirit. He had power to give breath unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in his right hand or in his forehead, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name." Okay, <clears throat> so several things were clearly outlined there. We have the worship of the beast. We have the image of the beast. We have the name of the beast. And we have the mark of the beast. Those four things, those four components, and they're all really coming together to make war on the kingdom of Yah. Now, something very striking, very interesting, uh, is that the final warning just before Yeshua comes is against this very thing. This is the final test. Revelation 14 verses 9 through 11 says, And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worships a beast in his image, or re and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who receive the beast, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. So notice that the mark and the name are, there's the name of the beast, the mark of the beast, and then the mark of his name is really bringing those two concepts together. We're going to show why that is today. Now, I just want you to understand that, that the kingdom of God that the beast is making war against, it is, it, it is, it is definitely going to be making war against the law of God, right? Because Yeshua said, if I by the finger of God cast out devils, the kingdom of God has come to you. So to make war against the kingdom of God means to be making war with his commandments. To be making war with his law. To be making war with the Torah. Right? That's, that's, that's obvious. His instructions. Now, when you look at the worship of the beast, the, the image of the beast, the name of the beast, and the mark of the beast, these four things of the kingdom of the enemy are the four great transgressions which are against the kingdom of God. They are the four great transgressions which are transgressing the kingdom of God. 
So, I, so usually we say, well, there's the mark of the beast, and we don't consider the fact that there is, it is actually bound up with four significant transgressions of God's law. Now, how do we find that? Well, well, you have the first law. What is the first commandment? To worship Yahuwah, right? To worship Yah, to worship God. You have the second one, have no graven images, right? You have the image of the beast. So the worship of the beast, then the image of the beast, and then the next one is the name of the beast. What is the third commandment? Shall not take the name of Yahuwah in vain. And the next one is the Sabbath commandment, right? And then you have the mark of the beast. Let me bring all of that together because I think that's very interesting. I'm going to read some of that. Exodus 20, verse 2 and 3. I'm Yahuwah Eloheka, which has brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. So here's clearly talking about the, the worship of the kingdom. That this is the worship of Yah, that he has freed you from the kingdoms of this world and from the slavery of sin. So that's the first one. Out of slavery, not part of the cultures of this world, not part of the bondage that is in this world, not part of the worship of the gods of this world, but that you are set apart for his worship. You have no other gods before him. And that's first. Now, Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5 says, You shall not make unto you any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. So when you look at that, it says make no graven images. Well, we're told that this second beast makes an image to the first beast. What are graven images, though? Graven images are only exp outward expressions of graven images which the carnal mind has carved out. What the, it's, it's an imagination. It starts in the carnal mind, the mind of the flesh, and they imagine and they put attributes upon a stone. You say how big it's going to be, what material it's going to be of. It's going to have a mouth that doesn't speak. It's going to have ears that don't hear. So it makes an image. So that is really what it is. An image is really a representation of the worship that you render or the authority that you regard. Now, when Adam was made in the image of God, because he was made in the image of God, he was to represent God being in his image, right? And he was, in that image, he was to be a reflection of the dominion under whose authority he was. When he ceased to be in the image of God, because he had fallen, he was now in the image of a beast. Because he had fallen away from that dominion that he had, and he fell under the authority of the, that old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. So, and, and when you look at Eve, this is very interesting. Eve, she made a graven image in her mind because she had started thinking her own thoughts that were, not, that were contrary to the Word of God, that she could eat the fruit and she couldn't trust God's Word anymore because God was a liar. God was a withholder. God was envious and jealous and that she had something to gain and to benefit from the benefactor, which was of a lesser order than God, from a created being. And so she exalts the creation above the Creator, and turns the image of the incorruptible God into really, in her mind, a graven image of a corruptible beast. When you look at that word image in Hebrew, it's salal. Salel, uh, and I did this in a, I showed you this in an earlier presentation. Salel, the root word means shadow. That means that you are, like when, when Adam was abiding under, in the image of God, when he was walking in the image of God, when he was walking in his God-appointed dominion, that he was walking in his shadow. He was a shadow. So when you look, when, when you move, your shadow moves. 
right? So you're co there's a corresponding movement. So as, as the, God, the God of heaven is moving, his dominion is moving and corresponding and relating in harmony, in movements that are harmonious to God's movements. That's what we see with our shadow as it is when it's cast from us. It's, it's, it's an image of us. And so that's really what, what an image is. It's, it's, a, it's a shadow picture of something. And really, when man makes a graven image, he is just projecting a shadow from what originated in his own mind. It did not originate from God. It's, it doesn't find its source in God, but it's false ideas. So you can actually make a graven image without making a graven image because it begins in your heart. We're told in Psalm 115, verses 4 through 8, Their idols are silver and gold, the works of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusts in them. So when you look at it, when you make an image, you are like that image that you have made. According to the God that you render or yield yourself to, so you are like you are in that image. Okay, so if, you're, so if you have a lifeless image, you have no spiritual life in you. If you are making an image to the beast, therefore you are in the image of the beast. That, right, you are, you are, spiritually, you are just, you are a reflection of that. You are falling under its dominion. You are its shadow. As it moves, so you shall move as well. Now, next commandment was about the name of the beast, right? It's how the name of the beast is making war against the third commandment. Exodus 20, verse 7, You shall not take the name of Yahuwah Eloheka in vain, for Yahuwah shall not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. It means to take it profit with, without profit. Uh, uh, when you, when you, what does it mean to take his name? It's not just to say uh, on your lips just idle words. To take his name means it's, it's a bit, think of a marriage covenant. How a wife bears the name of her husband. She falls under his house, under his authority, and bears his name, becoming one flesh with him or one family with him. So she takes on in the marriage covenant the name. All right, so this is a marriage covenant with him. He says, Listen, I brought you out, I've made you free. And now that I've made you free, your worship of me is to demonstrate that we're in covenant. There are ways when you are in a marriage covenant, things that you can do that show that you are unfaithful to the marriage covenant. And so we are in covenant with him and we bear his name. He has placed his name upon us and therefore he has appointed us to a certain standard in his law, his commandments that we ought to abide in. So we bear his name and we must walk worthy of that name or we are taking that name in vain and we are transgressing the covenant. The third commandment is all about covenant. Exodus 20, the fourth commandment, verses 8 through 10, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahuwah Eloheka, the Lord your God. In it you shall do not any work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your manservant nor your maidservant, nor your cattle nor the stranger that is within your gates. So, okay, so we talk about the worship of God in the first commandment. We talk in the second commandment about the image of God. And then the third one, we're talking about the covenant of God. And this last one is the sign of the covenant of God. What do you mean? Exodus 31, verse 13, it says the Sabbath is the sign of his covenant. 
It says, Speak thou also to the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath shall you keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am Yahuwah that does sanctify you, that makes you holy. I'm the God who makes time holy. I'm the God that makes you holy in that time. That word in Hebrew for sign is ot. Okay, ot. And that in Hebrew means evidence. It can mean a monument. It can mean a mark. A mark. A sign or a token. So when it says that it is a sign between me and you, it is a mark between me and you that I make you holy. So there's the mark of the beast that is making war with the fourth commandment, which is a sign of the authority of the beast and not the sign of the authority of God. The sign of what the beast makes holy and not what God makes holy. So we, we, so we know that they have replaced Sabbath with Sunday. They've replaced Passover with Easter. They pass, they've, they've Shavuot, the Feast of Oath, the Feast of uh, Weeks, Pentecost. They've, they've changed it for White Sunday. When you look at the Feast uh, uh, Christmas, Christmas is just a counterfeit of the Feast of Tabernacles, when you can actually prove that this is when Yeshua was born. So, very interesting, because you, you have the eighth day when he's circumcised, right? So you have all of these exchanges, counterfeits, not from God, but sanctifying other time according to the sanctification of the beast. Now, now, if we were to say all four of those commandments in, in other words, let's, let's, let's tr translate that, let's look at what that would look like in heaven if, if an angel was looking at those four commandments, okay? I think it's important that we understand that because a lot of times it says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But all of the commandments are promises. So, what does it mean in the first one? Well, it means to those who never fell. They're not angels of God in the law of the kingdom. Don't get, thou shalt not do this. You shall not have other gods. You shall not. No, because it's, 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 it's evident that they don't have other gods. The first commandment would be, you are made free sons and daughters of Yah. Therefore, worship him and keep his commandments. That's the first commandment. Worship him. Second commandment. You are made in the image of Yah. Therefore, trust in Him and hearken to the voice of His words. Make no graven image. Trust His words. Don't trust in your own imagination. Don't trust in your own ways. Trust in what He says. Have the faith of the Son. Think no thoughts of yourself. Abide in the image and dominion of God. What would the third commandment be as a promise? Thou shalt keep the covenant of Yahuwah Eloheka, that his name might rest upon you continually. Don't take his name in vain. So instead of negatives, we look at these as promises of identity, that he's now speaking into identity. You're made free, worship him. Uh, you're made free, so worship him. You're made in the image of God, therefore trust him. You've been, you abide in the covenant so that you can have his character always and you shall keep his Sabbath for it is the sign of the covenant for he has made you holy as he is holy. That's an interesting way of looking at the commandments. Three sons and daughters that can worship him, that are made in the image of God, that are made in covenant with him, that are made holy and will abide in holiness, the light of his kingdom. So what is the image of the beast? Well, when we look, it's very interesting when we compare it to Adam and how Adam was made in the image of God. Because that's, that's probably the best way, because you see that that symbolism is used in Revelation chapter 13. It says that the beast that is lamb-like, has la two lamb-like horns, that it comes out of the earth, like Adam. 
and it has two horns like a lamb and speaks as a dragon. So we're going to look at those two horns like a lamb, and we're going to look at the element of the dragon after. We're going to see what those two horns are, and what horns, what horns actually represent in the Bible. Some will say, well, it represents kings. Well, it's not just kings. It represents much more. It's a, it's a very deep concept in the Bible. And so I, I want us to understand in Hebrew thinking, Hebrew thought, what did a horn mean? And so, uh, so we're going to look at uh, this in sort of a more nuanced way. So again, that when we, we're going to look at the image of the beast, this beast that makes the image of the beast, really, uh, that, make, that is and becomes an image to the beast, it is effectively uh, coming up out of the earth just like Adam did. Now, the horns itself, it's very interesting that horns represent power and authority in the scriptures. Exodus 34, verse 29, tells us how Moses had light shining on his face. But what most people don't know is that when it says that, that the skin of his face was shining while they were talking with him, that this, this word for shining is, in Hebrew, the same root letters exactly. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, kuf resh nun. Same word, and it's, it's the word karan. Karan. Karan means to shine uh, as light is, is shining, like rays of light, like horns of light, quite literally, horns of light. So the root word there is actually, for karan, is karen, which just different vowels. It's the exact same word in Hebrew. It's karen. And so horns and light, or shining, means the same thing. And you can see that this is a beautiful illustration because it means something when it uses that word about the light that's shining on his face, that the light shining on his face was to designate something about the horns of Moses. I will, I will show you what I mean so that I'm not talking to you in parables, but that I can talk to you just plainly. That, that in the kingdom of heaven, you have to understand that there's only one kind of authority. And that authority is really resting on the light of His glory. The more of His glory that rests upon you, the, the greater the measure of your authority. The less the light of His glory shines upon you, the less authority you have. Because the horns, karen, represents the, the shining, the glory. Okay, These two are one. They, they mean the, the same thing in the kingdom of heaven. That if you're going to have the horn of authority in any capacity in the kingdom of God, you need to be lit with his glory. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Hannah, And Hannah prayed, this is after her petition was answered, pertaining to Samuel. And she said, My heart rejoices in Yah. My horn is exalted in Yahuwah. My horn is exalted in Yahuwah? My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Very interesting what she just said. My horn is exalted in him. Then she says in verse 10, The adversaries of Yah shall be broken in pieces out of heaven. He shall thunder upon them. Yehovah shall judge the ends of the earth. He shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his Messiah. Very interesting. You know that David is called a Messiah. Did you know that also Aaron in the Bible is called a Messiah, Mesheach? That's what it's called. When they're anointed, they are actually given that title. Not that they are the Messiah, but that they have received an anointing from the Messiah so that they are counted in their authority as a type of Messiah. And they're called Messiah. So that's kind of interesting. We look at Cyrus in the Bible. Cyrus prophesied by Isaiah, and he is called, he is called his Messiah, right? So, it's, so there is also that sort of connotation for kingly authority even uh, in, among the heathen. So it says that he will exalt 
he says, my horn is exalted in Yahuwah, and he shall exalt the horn of his Messiah and give strength to his king. And so this is really what her son was destined to do, was to anoint David a type of the Messiah, right? To anoint the king. And so we're told that he does that in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, where Yahuwah says, fill your horn with oil and go and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite where I provided me a king from among his sons. So understand something that you have horns like shofars, ram's, ram's horns, okay, that you would sort of sound them, but you also have uh, horns that were not open like this and you would have the oil poured into it and then it would be poured out onto the head. Uh, over the head of the priest or the king that was anointed. You see? That it says, fill your horn with oil and consecrate, anoint him as king. You would anoint as priest or you would anoint as king. In Psalm 89, verse 17, it says, for you are the glory of their strength and in your favor our horn, or in your grace, or by your grace, our horn shall be exalted. Psalm 92, the Sabbath psalm, in verse 10, it says, But my horn shalt thou exalt, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. So, of course, on the Sabbath day, this was the time when the candlesticks were reordered with oil, renewed by the priests. But the, but the oil represents the Holy Spirit that would come into the candlesticks, which represent the church. Represents the priesthood, represents the church, represents the, the church authority, represents kingly authority. The horn represents the, the, the karan, means the glory of God that is resting upon the kings or upon the priests or upon the church generally. So that's what a horn symbolizes in the Bible. And so when it, you see horns, it, it can represent the kings of Media and Persia having horns, right? So it's, it's, it's talking about the kind of authority that they have. We know that heathen kings were anointed. Elijah was told to anoint Hazael, king of Syria. He was a wicked king. He was a wicked king, and he wasn't a king of Israel, and he wasn't a king of Judah. Why would he be anointed? But even those kings were accounted as represent, being represented by horns and being anointed or chosen by God to fill their place. God raises up kings and he removes kings. So here we find that there are two horns like a lamb that comes up on the image beast. That means it has literally two kinds of authority Two kinds of power in the kingdom. We know a beast is a kingdom. Two horns means that there are, it is literally a dual legislative authority. If you have one king, it means it's a monarchy. One, one horn can mean a monarchy. The little horn, in this case, it's a different kind of horn, and it actually was a priest king, a corrupt priest king. These two horns like a lamb represent that this kingdom that rises up would have dual legislative authority. So what do those two horns represent? Are they two kings? No. In this case, when we see that the first beast is losing its power, receiving a wound by a sword, that the other beast is rising up out of the earth. And this is, of course, the United States of America. And it is destined to exercise all the power of the first beast before it. What are those two horns? Well, some will say it's a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. You know, the Constitution is actually protected by two legislative powers in the United States. I'm going to read just from the Constitution itself. It says, all legislative powers, all legislative powers, here and granted, shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. The Constitution, Article 1, Section 1, speaking about the legislature, where the laws are made. This is where the laws are passed, whereby a kingdom, because a kingdom is nothing without laws. 
A nation is nothing without laws. You can't make war against God's laws unless you have laws which are in opposition to that law. So the Constitution speaks about the legislature and says Congress is divided into two institutions, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The two houses of Congress have equal but unique roles in federal government. While they share legislative responsibilities, each house also has special constitutional duties and powers. To balance the interest of both the small and large states, the framers of the Constitution divided the power of Congress between the two houses. So it's not just in one single place. We see that there are two horns. Now, we know that after, so it has that legislative power. That is where the authority rests in America, is with those two legislative branches. Startling when you have the representative of the beast, the papacy, speaking to a joint house, a joint session of Senate and House of Representatives in a joint session of Congress. On Yom Kippur, on the Day of Judgment, breaking the lamb-like horns, as it were, but yet not the legislative authority it has leaving the house desolate. What is the image of the beast? If, if, if the beast representative was right in the heart of the nation at that time, on the day of judgment, we know that the image of that beast cannot be far off. So he comes up out of the earth like Adam, and Adam was made in the image of God. But we should expect <laughs> that when he speaks as a dragon that there's going to be a pattern, dominion of, of authority that is exercised in America like what was seen in the Papal Dark Ages. Revelation 13 verses 14 through 15, how does he speak as a dragon? That's what I want to ask, how does he speak as a dragon? Well, he says to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had a, the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give breath unto the image of the beast. And that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So I want you to understand something. That, that what is being spoken of, the spirit of the dragon in America, the spirit of Satan really, uh, which is working through the people, is advocating for something regarding the worship of the first beast, regarding the worship of the papacy, and saying that they should make an image. Understand that when the beast, when Adam came up out of the earth, it didn't have breath. What we see is that there's, an, there's a beast that comes up out of the earth, but the dragon-like features of it really have not awakened until it is able to legislate that image of the beast whereby all shall be killed. It needs, how can it, how can it do that except it has breath to give? And how can it do that unless the people themselves have a spirit where they are demanding the kind of legislation that you find in the papal beast system? And it says that they work signs and wonders, miracles calling down fire from heaven, Speaking as a dragon, well, how do you speak? You speak with your tongue. Who among the Christians would advocate for something like that? Well, we know that this, was, this is charismatic Pentecostalism with the spirit of signs and wonders. It has breath, it has spirit to give life to the image of the papacy. So when we looked at Tony Palmer, who was speaking at the Kenneth Copeland Charismatic Leadership Conference. He was saying that everybody is Catholic again. And so what is he saying? He's saying, assume the name of the beast. Assume the name of the beast. You're all one. So you should be in covenant together, right? So now, how is the image of the beast going to speak? It needs to receive, really, it's to speak as a dragon, and when it speaks through the people, to make that image of the beast, breath will come in 
and it will give life to oppression. It'll give life to the dominion that we saw in the Dark Ages over the beast. We should see charismatic Pentecostalism getting more political. And do we see that? Absolutely we see that. Do we see that when it comes to, uh, when we look at the, even just with Donald Trump, I told you before, he's a great president. Uh, if you were to, to have a president, he's an excellent president. But he was also sort of having the undercurrent, uh, the undercurrent of, of fulfilling this prophecy was there. Uh, how religious he ended up bringing about sort of these re uh, religious uh, ideologies into the White House and into the United States in general. And awakening and enabling the legislative um, uh, hunger of and the political desires of the charismatic Pentecostals. Now, so the beast out of the earth receives breath and is made into the image of the beast, whereas Adam had received breath and he was made into the image of God. Now, image doesn't mean likeness. I want you to understand something. So it doesn't mean that the United States now, this, that, that this government is going to become like the government of the Dark Ages. It's not going to become a monarchy. Image does not mean likeness. Likeness uh, says that Adam was made in his image, according to his likeness, so there's, but there's two specific words that are used there in Hebrew. And the image literally means like a shadow, doing sort of corresponding to the same kind of actions, doing what, you're, what the image that you're made from is doing. Okay? So what is the beast doing? The image is going to do the same. A likeness in Hebrew is demut. Demut means to resemble. So it's saying that if it was in the likeness of the first beast, it would say, let us make a monarchy. But it doesn't do that. We don't see that in, in America. America will be what it is, uh, essentially a, a democratic republic, uh, although the days of the republic are fast waning. But it still ends up uh, having the people in democratic fashion oppressing the minority of God's commandment-keeping people. Now, the government of the United States doesn't represent or doesn't, sorry, doesn't resemble the papal monarchical government of the Dark Ages, but it is still operating in respect to the works of the papal beast according to doing likewise in their dominion, just like Adam was to be doing, and still fulfilling the law of the papacy in establishing laws that are in harmony with the object of the papacy. So let's look at now the name of the beast, because I, I just touched on it just momentarily, but I'm going to go more into the name of the beast now. When you look at the Theodosian Code, Theodosian was a Roman emperor. He lived in 390 CE, and he had legislated a very particular uh, the, the Theodosius Codex, very interesting piece of legislation that caused a lot of problems, especially in Thessalonica. And it says, let us believe the one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in equal majesty and in a holy trinity. We command the followers of this law to assume the name of Catholic Christians, the name of the beast. But for the rest, since we judge them as foolish and insane, we decree that they shall be branded with the ignominious name of heretics to be smitten first by divine punishment, then also by the vengeance of our authority. It's very, very proud words. Rick Center, can you put on the lights, please? <coughs> To be branded. What does it mean to be branded? To be branded with the ignominious name of heretics. Put upon them the name of the beast. If they do not assume the name Catholic Christian, if they will not willingly take the name of Catholic Christians there, let them have the name of the heretic. Well, this, there's a lot that can be said about that, but what does it mean to brand them? when you're branding them in this fashion. A word for branding, according to Oxford language's definition, it says that 
a brand is an identifying mark burned on livestock or as or criminals or slaves with a branding iron literally you would take the iron you'd put it in fire and it become so searing hot and then you would put the mark upon that individual and it would say that you are their owner or they're a criminal therefore they are numbered this is the number of that criminal so that if they escape and they're found again that they know who they were but it's interesting also when it says that when you think about this that it's an identifying mark that's burned on a criminal the one who's breaking the law with a branding iron iron is the very thing that was the Roman church's medal in Daniel chapter 2. Iron is the power of the papacy. We're told that, that the fourth beast that was the Roman Empire had great iron teeth and iron nails. Some will say, well, it was brass nails. It was actually in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was both iron nails and iron teeth. And it says that you're to be called a heretic or divisive or promoting your own personal opinion, that's what a heretic means in Greek, to harm, be harmfully divisive. And so they, they said, like, call, call them foolish, call them mad, because they're preferring their own way, their own choice, rather than to assuming the name of the beast. You're not willing to be in covenant with them, not walking in concert with them, and not walking in their ways. So the mark of the beast is called the mark of his name. And so, obviously, that when you assume the name of the beast and you're being in covenant with him, means that you're in communion with him, and therefore you're standing in agreement with the Catholic Church. And then, evidently, it is the mark of his name, because you have assumed that name, therefore you are doing what they do because you have assumed that title. You have the name of the beast when you are in covenant with them, when you're in council with that church. Now, if that's the case then you are being a partaker of Babylon, and therefore you must be a partaker of her sins. That's what it means to have the mark of his name. It means not only that you're a partaker of Babylon, but you're joined to also her sins. And that's why he says, come out from Babylon, be not partakers of her sins. So don't, don't have the mark, don't have her name. Get out from her. Don't have her character. Now, a name, of course, that's another thing, is that the name represents character in the Bible. And if you look at the, 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 that it, what it meant to assume the name <clears throat> Catholic Christian, it meant to have a certain character. It meant you had to hate the heretic with the kind of hatred uh, that the Catholic Church hated them. You had to regard as heretics those who they deemed as heretics. You had to consent and agree to their judgment of the heretic as well, because they had that kind of authority. So you end up having the name of the beast, and therefore you're, in, you're standing in agreement with them. You are one with them. And therefore, consenting to it, you will also be condemned with them. That's a very serious thing. Now, now I'm not saying that God doesn't love individual Catholics, that he doesn't love... Uh, he does... And there are many that are in ignorance, there are many that are in darkness, but that time is quickly going away as more and more light shines from the Torah, from the law of God, from the scriptures, and we are seeing reality for what it is. That the true heretics that have departed from the faith, in fact, uh, it's the Catholic system. And so God is warning people to come out from that system, to come out from that name, because you don't want to be a partaker of her character and start condemning the children of the kingdom of God as foolish and as madmen and as heretics that should be struck down with divine vengeance and that their freedom to life should be revoked justly by the power of government. But I see people today, when we talk about the vaccine, and I see exactly that. That people are, are hateful and they say that they should be justly shut out of society because they're not yielding to the power and demands of government. What happens when the government joins a state when you already have that kind of hatred for people? It's the name of the beast. 
So to bear the name of Catholic Christians at that time, and really in prophecy, means that you have to also bear the name of the God of the Catholics, which is what Theodosian said. And that means to have not the name of God on your forehead, but to have the triune God in the forehead. Mystery. The mystery of the Trinity, right? Mark, uh, the mark of the beast, the last point that I want to get into of the four. We already have addressed, uh, we have already addressed the element of worship, we've already addressed the image of the beast, and we've addressed the name of the beast. Now we're going to look at the mark of his name, the mark of the beast. So the mark of God, according to the fact that the Seventh-day Sabbath is the sign, the alt uh, of, of God, the mark of God is the seventh-day Sabbath, and it is a sign of His covenant, the sign that the name is upon you. It is a sign of His sealing of His Spirit, because the Spirit of God, the, the, the oil was poured out into the church on, or into the, 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 the menorah by the priest on the Sabbath. He was ordering it every Sabbath day. And Psalm 92, that He would pour us with, uh, He would anoint us with fresh oil. So the seal of God is found within the Sabbath day commandment. So it is a sign of his covenant, and it is the seal, really, of his covenant. It is the sign of his holiness, and that he makes us holy. That we are called to be holy as he is holy. But Daniel 7, verse 25, tells us that the little horn power presumed and thought to change times and laws. It says that they would speak great, that he would speak great words against the Most High. That's what the Catholic Church did. He would wear out the saints of the Most High because he made war with them. That's what the Catholic Church did and thought to change times and laws. So he thought to alter, to change, to abrogate and abolish the Torah, the times of worship of God. And so what did Yeshua say? He said, think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I've come not to destroy but to fulfill. And now, here's this presumptuous power coming and thinking to change it. So, replacing Sabbath with Sunday, taking all of the heathen days, this Christmas that's coming up, is a Catholic holiday. And by the way, that, that word holiday, holy day. That's where that word holiday comes from. You say, happy holidays. It's not holy. Scripture doesn't declare it holy. God never declared it holy. It's not a holiday. Just because words have taken on sort of a new meaning doesn't mean the root meaning is not the same. A holiday is a holy day. Christmas is not holy because a man who ordains a pagan time cannot make a day holy. God can make time holy because he decrees it, he ordains it, and he sanctifies it by his word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So he gives us his word, and his word sanctifies the matter. It's not anything but the word that sanctifies. It's not the word of a man, not the tradition of a man, and not certainly not pagan ideologies. Leviticus 18 says the danger of adopting pagan ideologies and not keeping the commandments of God. Leviticus 18, verse 3 says, After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwelt, you shall not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, wherein I bring you, you shall not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall not walk in their laws, their statutes. Remember that those feast days that God ordained by His word to sanctify them, these were ordinances forever. Leviticus 18, verse 26 through 30, it says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourns among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done which were before you, and the land is defiled. Remember it says not to defile the Sabbath. It says, That is a sign that I sanctify you, therefore defile not the Sabbath, or you shall be cut off. Now it says, all these abominations the, land, the, the, the men of the land have done, which were before you, and the land is defiled, that the land vomits not you out also when you defile it, as it spewed out, it vomited out those nations which were before you. We know that Laodicea is chiefly guilty of adopting the ordinances of Egypt and of Babylon. 
simply because it is vomited out. And that's what the scripture warns against. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall you keep mine ordinance that you commit not any of these abominable customs which were committed before you and that you defile not yourselves therein. I am Yahuwah Eloheka, the Lord your God. Learn not the way of the heathen. Papal encyclical, Dies Domini, which means the day of the Lord, uh, in Latin, John Paul II said, wise pastoral intuition, to you judge whether this is wise, wise pastoral intu intuition suggested to the church the Christianization of the notion of Sunday as the day of the sun, which was the Roman name for the day and which was retained in some modern languages. This was in order to draw the faithful away from the seduction of cults which worshipped the sun and to direct the celebration of the day of Christ, humanity's true sun. This is sun worship. And they said that they've just baptized sun worship and they've caught, they, it's still sun worship, but they're now put, saying that it belongs to Yeshua, Christ. So this is what they've done. This is their mark, their sign of what they have sanctified according to their own uh, wisdom. Remember, the wisdom of man is foolishness with God. And so they brand you with their mark, an identifying mark of the name of Catholicism. So that means that the image of the beast, America, has to adopt the name of the beast in, in, in a very real sense. So when you see that the Protestant churches are all saying, we're all Catholic again, and they're getting very ecumenical, very close to the Catholics, you should be concerned. We're looking at forced, being forced to have an identifying mark. And if you have that, you are a transgressor of the law of church and state if you don't, if you, if you violate uh, this mark of their authority. So you don't want to be branded as a beast, do you? You don't want to be in the image of a beast, though. Because if you're in the image of the beast, they brand you with their mark, and that never will go away. You can't wash it off. It is that unpardonable sin because it's the final warning. It's very serious. The Catholic record in London, Ontario, September 1st, 1923. Sunday is the mark of our authority. The church is above the Bible and the transference of the Sabbath is proof of that fact. Cardinal Gibbons in 1895 said, of course the Catholic Church claims the change was her act and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Now, we just have two statements. It's their mark. Just like God says, it's his mark, the Sabbath day. So you have this war of kingdoms, the war of the beasts against God. So the question is, who sanctifies time and who sanctifies the soul? If I sanctify time and I sanctify the soul, I sanctify myself, therefore I can sanctify whatever time I want. And that's what, isn't that not the argument that you see? They say, listen, I can sanctify, I, I, it doesn't matter what day you rest, it just means I need to keep one out of seven days. So you're the one who makes this time holy now. It's based on you, your preference, your imagination, not upon the word of God anymore. It departs from the law of God. Well, that practically justifies the papacy and their, their boastful claims. It's a sign that man sanctifies time. And you say that, well, you think about the feast days, the gathering, the assembling of yourselves together. And they say, well, you know, we can have feasts today. There are, there are camp meetings and we can have them whenever we want. Doesn't mean we have to have them at specific times. Definitely not the times that God says in his word. I've heard that before. Well, you're sanctifying time then, 
but that's the authority of a man, and it rises no higher than a man, and why should it have a blessing that is any higher than that of a man? The almighty presence of a mere corrupt man is now decreeing time as holy, and we know that that's a great sin. And when we look at Sunday, well, it's interesting. We have, we have uh, Yahuwah being, uh, and, and, and really Sabbath, being really joined together. It's his sign. So we should expect the Trinity and Sunday to be together. Well, that's very true. The Church's Year of Grace by Pius Parch in 1953 said this, the feast of the Most Holy Trinity should make us mindful that every that actually every Sunday is devoted in honor to the Most Holy Trinity. That every Sunday is sanctified and consecrated to the Triune God. Sunday is therefore the day of the Most Holy Trinity. So you have the name of the God, and you have the sign of that God. St. Andrew's Daily Missal, this is actually um, quite well regarded, highly regarded in the Catholic Church. Sunday is consecrated throughout the year to the Holy Trinity because God the Father began the work of creation on the first day. The Son rose from the dead on a Sunday and the Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost Sunday. So you see that it's saying the Father did something on the first day, the Son did something on the first day, the Holy Spirit did something on the first day. Therefore, keep Sunday holy because it is a day for the Trinity. A.T. Jones in Ecclesiastical Empires, page 873 or 837 and 838 said, Now, what more was ever required by the papacy in all phases of the old order of things than is thus brought within the meaning of the national constitution by this decision? Because there is, of course, a push uh, to bring in Sunday laws. What more was ever required by the papacy itself than that the Christian religion should be the national religion, that the discipline of the church should be maintained by the civil power, that the religious test oath should be applied to all, that there should be a required belief in the doctrine of the Trinity, and that everybody should be required by law to observe Sunday. Interestingly, how he connects the requirements of the belief in the doctrine of the Trinity and requirements by law to observe Sunday. So, what is the sum of the matter in the warfare of the beast? The worship of the beast, the image of the beast, the name of the beast, and the mark of the beast. It is a war against God. Those who worship Yah, are to have the image of Yah. Those who worship the true God are to have the image of the true God. Colossians 3, verse 9 and 10, Deceive not one another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds, and you have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him that created him. So we're renewed in knowledge according to the image of him that created us. So we're to be restored into the image of him that made us. Revelation 14, verse 1. We're to have the name of Yah. So not just worshiping Yah, and having the image of Yah, we're to have his name. It says, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having the Father's name in their foreheads. More than this, we're to have the seal and the sign of the covenant, the sign of Yah, being in covenant with him. You find that in 2 Ezra's, Ezra's, so you find that in the King James Apocrypha. Chapter 2, verses 38 and 42, it says, Arise and stand up, behold the number of them that are sealed in the feast of Yahuwah. What? Arise and stand up. Behold the number of them that are sealed in the feast of Yahuwah. The Sabbath is a feast. And I, Ezra, saw upon Mount Zion a great people whom I could not number, and they all praised Yahuwah with songs. Mount Zion has a people standing upon it that are sealed in the feast, and they are praising Yahuwah, and they have the name of God, they have the seal of the feast, therefore they have the Sabbath day, the sign that they keep. So, 
in summary, this is really what this is. When you receive the mark of the beast, you must violate the first commandment. And if you violate the first commandment, you're forfeiting your freedom from the kingdoms of this world. You will never be free because when the Messiah, our deliverer, returns, he can't take you from the land of Egypt and he can't take you out of the house of bondage because you have chosen Egypt. That's what the ten tribes did. The ten tribes, just before they fell, they aligned themselves with the power of Egypt. Isaiah talked about this and he reproved it. He said this in Isaiah chapter 30, verses 1 through 3, Woe to the rebellious children, saith Yahuwah, that taketh counsel but not by me, that, and that cover with a covering and not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk, that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. What is that word for shadow? Sel. The same word for selel, image. The image of Egypt is going to be your downfall, is what he says. And what does he say in conclusion? This is really profound in verse 7. For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore I have cried concerning this, that their strength is to sit still. But I actually looked at the Hebrew and I looked at the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are the oldest manuscripts, and it doesn't read like that. It actually says that he, he didn't cry concerning it, that it, her strength was to sit still. It says this, that I cried unto her, not concerning this, it's lazot, which means concern, uh, cried unto her, Rahab, let them rest. Literally, let them Shabbat. Rahab being a harlot. And so he's saying to them, he says, Rahab, harlot, let them rest. He cries with a loud cry. Very interesting that that's what it said in Isaiah chapter 30. Now, what does he say in conclusion to this? Let them Shabbat, let them rest. Isaiah 30, verse 8 and 9 says, Now go and write it before them upon a table and engrave it in a book, that it may be. Now go and write it them upon a table and engrave it in a book, that it may be for a time to come forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people, a lying children, children that will not hear the law of Yahuwah. If you receive the mark of the beast, you must violate the second commandment. And therefore, the first commandment you violate, you don't have the freedom of God, and you're not going to come off of this earth when the Messiah comes to deliver. If you receive the mark of the beast, you violate the second commandment, which is about graven images. When you violate that, you forfeit the right to be made in the image of God. And you shall not reign with the Messiah upon his throne. You shall not be in the image of his dominion. If you receive the mark of the beast, you must violate the third commandment. And you have forfeited the name of God. Therefore, you forfeited his character, his glory, and his covenant. You've taken the name of the beast, which is the number of a man. The number six. And so the authority and the covenant you've chosen is according to a man and according to his corrupted character. And you must yield yourself to the fornication of the church with the kings of the earth. That's the character. That's the name of the beast, according to the mark of the beast. Now, lastly, if you receive the mark of the beast, you must violate the fourth commandment. You forfeit the sign of the covenant, having forfeited the covenant, having forfeited the image of God, having forfeited your freedom. You forfeit the sign of the covenant. You forfeit holiness because you forfeited the seal of the sanctification in the Holy Spirit. You shall have no rest day nor night when you worship the beast and his image, when you receive his mark in your forehead or in your hand, when you receive the mark of his name. You are marked with the kingdoms of this world and you shall have no inheritance nor portion in the kingdom of Yah. That is the warning that we have. That is the controversy of the kingdoms. It's the kingdom of man versus the kingdom of God. The kingdom of the beast 
versus the kingdom of God. If we are not willing to walk in the Sabbath commandment, who knew, like dominoes, everything else would fall? That if you don't have the sign of the covenant, means you don't have the, which is the mark of his covenant, then you don't have the mark of God. That means you don't have the covenant with God. If you don't have the covenant with God, and you don't have his name, and you don't have his character, it means you don't have his image. And if you don't have his image, you're in bondage, you're not free. And you're not his child. It's a very serious implication. Because you have to stand, and we're coming to that time very quickly. You're going to have to stand on one of these sides. Who are you going to choose? Are you going to choose life or death, blessing or cursing? Are you going to choose the authority of a man? The corruptible man who's made an image of the beast? Or will you choose the incorruptible, imperishable God? The choice is yours. With that, let's pray. And I trust that you will soberly consider uh, making the decision that your Heavenly Father would call you to make. Merciful, loving Father, I want to thank you so much for the light that is in your word, for the revelation of your Son, Yeshua, and also for the revelation of your kingdom, which he is because he is appointed as king of that kingdom. I also thank you that you've called us to be overcomers, that if we are overcoming, that we can sit on that throne and reflect that image, having the sign of your covenant and being covenant fellowship with you. Father, please lighten us with your glory. Cause us to receive your anointing and to walk in your ways and not to deceive ourselves, not to be rebellious, lying children, <laughs> not to not walk in your ways, Father, not to rebel against you. You said that those who do your commandments, that they, they that keep your commandments, uh, that they that, that don't keep your commandments are, <laughs> are deceiving themselves, and they do not the truth, but, but they, they lie if they say they know you. Father, we want to know you in truth. So please, may we walk in your commandments. May we walk even as your son walked. And may we be faithful to the kingdom of light, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of truth and righteousness. And we thank you so much. In the wonderful and precious name of your son, Yeshua. Amen.